This is your daily dose of all things royal. A travelist uh, for us communities is the people and the places, the landscapes, the ecosystems, the assets that belong to you, and the businesses, the cultures that make each place unique and ultimately a destination that the world wants to visit. Welcome back, my gorgeous, good-looking friends. Earlier today, I did a video on the ongoing African Park scandal in which Prince Harry is being called out to step down as a board member for this charity. I'm in this video, and I highly recommend you check it out if you didn't see it. There's valid reason as to why Prince Harry will not step down, and that's because of something called green colonialism. After listening to Prince Harry give his pep talk to the employees of Travelist, it all started to click together as to what is really going on here. So on the surface, what we have here is a coalition of these mega tech companies coming together to offer regular folk like you and I the best options in travel to save the planet, whether it be from eco travel and cutting carbon emissions, as well as sustainability in these communities. I mean, a lot of greenwashing going on here. I did explain this in a previous video that I did where you see travel is listed and it is a form of greenwashing. But then on the other side of the travelist business is made for the so-called corporations. Now, when you look at the things that Harry has been involved in, such as African parks and why he's not speaking out, especially around the abuses of the indigenous people in order to force them out, you start to put two and two together as to how travelists will be making their money and what it's set up and designed to do. And without the destinations, there is no business. So we understand that it is crucial that we strive to do better by the people and places that we collectively depend on. This is a powerful coalition of some of the biggest names in travel and technology. Not one entity entity can own sustainability. We need to work together to change the course and focus on how travel and tourism can bring prosperity to the whole entire system. Through the hard work and dedication of all of you here in this room, We're seeing firsthand the power of collaboration to make change happen. Now, ever since this scandal had broke, I had been putting a little more time into researching about Harry and Meghan's interests in Africa. As we've seen last year, Meghan's interest in claiming that she's 43 percent Nigerian and all of a sudden now her investment in giving period pads to kids in Africa. We see Harry participating with Santa Bali and then also the UN's interest in transforming Africa for this agenda 2063. Now, I had presented some information around it showing you that it almost feels like we have these billionaires going onto the land trying to force the indigenous people off in order to pillage the land for its wonderful resources instead of giving it back to the people. Now, the UN SDG goals claiming to try and solve hunger as well as poverty by 2030 almost feels like a farce because it appears that the poor keep getting poorer and the rich keep getting richer. There doesn't seem to be any sort of gap that is closing. In fact, the gap is widening as a result. So as I look into this and reading about this scandal, you start to put things together to figure out what is the real agenda here. And I stumbled upon this article back in the year of 2022 talking about African parks. And now when we see Harry's involvement with Travelist, it all makes a lot of sense. So get comfortable because I'm going to read this to you so you can hear how much sense this now makes as to why Meghan and Harry are involved in this and what is in it for them now. Folks, this was never about conservation. This has always been about making money. And when we see Harry and Meghan try to portray that they are these humanitarians trying to save the world, know that they're lying. Know that they are lining their pockets somehow. And we have to continue to dig further beyond what they're showing us. So now this write-up that I'm bringing to you comes from witnessradio.org, which is a nonpartisan and not-for-profit registered network of human rights investigative journalists, lawyers, social workers using legal aid support, and media-leading approaches with a main focus to promote 
and protect economic, social, and cultural rights and development in Uganda. And this organization did a write-up and expose around what has been going on with African parks. And this is what we're going to get into. Published two years ago, it says, Conservation Concessions as Neo-Colonization, the African Parks Network. The conservation industry is now promoting the idea of buying up conservation concessions and reconstituting them as business models with profit-seeking aims. A case in point is the African Parks Network, which manages 19 national parks and protected areas in 11 countries in Africa. Now, just when you think you couldn't despise Meghan and Harry anymore, they always find a way to surprise you. After I go through this, you're going to realize how evil and disgusting these globalists and billionaires are to be doing this, especially when you look at how the travelist model is set up and Harry being quite silent around the abuses that are happening with the Baca people. The article begins by saying, Concessions for so-called conservation purposes, national parks, protected areas, nature reserves, etc., have their roots in the ideas and beliefs that underpinned European colonization. The concept of protected areas originated in the United States in the late 1800s, founded on the desire to preserve intact areas of wilderness without human presence, mainly for elite hunting and the enjoyment of scenic beauty. Both Yellowstone and Yosemite National Parks were forcibly emptied of their inhabitants and provided the blueprint for doing conservation that continues to the present day. During that same period, European colonizers declared large tracts of the occupied territories in Africa as game reserves after forcibly displacing populations from said areas. These reserves were often created after colonialist hunters had already exterminated much of the wildlife population in an effort to restore such populations so that they could continue big game hunting. However, the withdrawal of European colonizers from Africa did not bring about a return to customary land tenure. Newly formed states often continued the land use and conservation policies of the colonizers, which demonstrates how deep colonial norms and knowledge systems had become institutionalized. Colonization processes have always been accompanied by the idea that nature is separate from humans and that civilization is better than the unpredictable and unproductive wilderness. The idea of creating areas of nature without humans is thus rooted in the racist and colonial thinking that only white, civilized men were able to protect and manage this nature. They, and only they, could enter this otherwise human-free nature. And we can observe that in many places. This idea persists even today. Safari tourism, for example, is simply a continuation of this tradition. Wealthy, predominantly white tourists are paying large sums of money to stay in luxury hotels and receive permission to shoot animals with guns or cameras as trophies. Meanwhile, those populations that hunt for subsistence inside their territories, turned park, are labeled as poachers and criminalized. Such tourism relies on certain constructions of what Africa means to those undertaking the safaris which can reveal the colonial mindset that created these reserves in the first place. That is why protected areas are mostly people-free landscapes. People are rarely portrayed as an intrinsic part of nature, and if they are, they are depicted either as intruders or poachers or as touristic landscapes for buying handcrafts or watching dances, or as guides or echo guards working for a foreign company or NGO. Most international conservation NGOs have facilitated this depiction of indigenous peoples as invaders in their own territories. This narrative has conveniently placed their focus on fighting against people using the forest for their own subsistence instead of on the consumption patterns and economic interests of the supporters and funders of said NGOs. The Serengeti National Park of Tanzania, for example, is arguably the best-known symbol of Africa's wild nature. Yet, 
There's hardly any mention in the park's tourist propaganda on how the Serengeti was created. By evicting the indigenous Maasai during colonial times from their ancestral territories. And this situation continues today. Mordecai Ogata, co author of the book The Big Conservation Lie, explains in a 2021 interview that the geographical spaces of protected areas frequently work as colonies, with the difference that they are no longer under the management of an empire, but a network of elites with clear economic and political interests. Those, he explained, are the colonizers with respect to conservation concessions. They enter such agreements with large sums of money and frequently influence any national policy that might impact their interests and managed areas. The power of these networks of colonizers is both physical, enforcing their rule and dominance on the ground, and political, having allies in the right places administering key governmental offices and funding positions. On top of this, possible conflicts that may arise are easily brushed aside as not their responsibility. This is done by placing the burden on the sovereign condition of national governments. These networks answer to donors, the tourist industry and tourists themselves, which are all mainly based in the global north. And they endure on the basis of images of peaceful landscapes which in their imaginations are landscapes without people. These networks also involve powerful business people with vested interests in financing conservation for offsetting their missions or greenwashing their dirty and destructive activities. Recent examples include the internet retailer Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos and his $10 billion Earth Fund, with some of the biggest conservation NGOs receiving $100 million each in a first round of payments, and Swiss billionaire businessman Hans-Jörg Weiss' donations to the so-called 30 by 30 scheme, which aims for 30% of the planet to be turned into protected areas by 2030. Nowadays, the conservation industry is promoting the idea of buying up conservation concessions protected areas or parks, and reconstituting them as business models with profit-seeking aims. A case in point is the African Parks Network, which manages 19 national parks and protected areas in 11 countries in Africa. The African Parks Network, outsourcing protected areas to private companies. The African Parks Network, APN, was founded by billionaire Dutch tycoon Paul Fentoner in the year 2000. Its founding name was the African Parks Foundation. Fentoner comes from one of the Netherlands' richest industrial dynasties and was CEO of the energy conglomerate SHV Holdings, which undertook business with the apartheid regime in South Africa. He allegedly had the idea for creating African Parks after a dinner hosted by Nelson Mandela in the presence of Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands, at which the future of national parks in South Africa was discussed. For the billionaire, it was the perfect opportunity to restore his image, tainted by his activities during the apartheid regime. Initially created as a commercial company, African Parks swapped this status for that of an NGO in 2005 in order to more easily attract donors and conservation funding. APN's business model is based on a public-private partnership, PPP, strategy for the management of protected areas, whereby APN maintains the full responsibility and execution of all management functions and is accountable to the government. APN employs a market approach to wildlife conservation, arguing that wildlife can pay for its conservation if well-managed. It presents itself as an African solution for Africa's conservation challenges. However, behind the facade of APN is a large group of northern and southern governments, multilateral institutions, international conservation organizations, millionaire family foundations, and individuals that fund its conservation business. Since 2017, the president of the company is Prince Henry of Wales, otherwise known as Prince Harry, a member of the British royal family, 
who has helped in the acquisition of funding and partners. So just so you know, this article was written in 2022 before Harry crossed over onto the executive board of directors. Anyhow, APN controls a total area of 14.7 million hectares in Africa, about half the size of Italy, and it intends to expand even more in order to manage 30 parks by 2030 across 11 biomes, ensuring that 30 million hectares are well managed, thus contributing to the broader vision of having 30% of Africa's unique landscapes protected in perpetuity. Moreover, their roadmap to 2030 states that 10 more protected areas spanning a further 5 million hectares will be managed by select partners through our newly created incubator program. These objectives are ambitious and will contribute significantly to the global target of protecting 30% of the Earth to keep the planet flourishing. The network also indicates its interest in selling carbon credits as an additional source of income. Although such credits basically facilitate more pollution and fossil fuel burning, the website of APN claims that its conservation model represents an integrated nature-based solution to climate change. We secure the carbon captured in the plants and soil in places of high biodiversity value. However, experiences on the ground reveal how this so-called public-private partnership is in fact reinforcing and recreating oppressive power relations. A 2016 academic study on the Majeti Wildlife Reserve in Malawi is a case in point. The reserve has been managed by APN since 2003 with a 25-year management concession. It was the first park to fall under APN's administration. According to the concession they were granted, APN is supposed to involve community members in the management of the reserve. This includes consulting them in issues requiring critical decisions such as bringing new animals into the area and allowing said members to access and use some of the resources in the reserve such as grass, fish, and reeds. While there is a formal and legal partnership between the Malawian government and African Parks Network on the sharing of proceeds, there is no formal or clear agreement between local communities and African Parks Network on how benefits are going to be shared out. The benefits for the communities are only indirect. By engaging in activities such as selling food and performing dances for a tourist public, African Parks Network argues that apart from physically accessing the resources from the game reserve, communities will benefit from wildlife conservation through employment, income-generating activities they're engaged in, and via APN's corporate responsibility initiatives. However, according to the research, communities are rarely allowed to fish or to harvest honey or reeds in the game reserve. Instead, they are allowed to harvest only grass at specific times a year, with the park management putting forth the argument that communities are supposed to protect and conserve these areas, and that such harvesting disturbs the animals. And whether without the stories, the connection, and the safeguarding that you provide, the world has no destinations to visit. And without the destinations, there is no business. So we understand that it is crucial that we strive to do better by the people and places that we collectively depend on. One woman interviewed for the research was reported as saying, We have lost control over our means of livelihood, but cannot also get employed by African Parks Network. We are prevented from accessing resources that we need for our daily substance life, such as fish, mushrooms, and honey. The same research also underlines how African Parks Network deceptively used local people to achieve its own goals, but in such a way as to be of no benefit to the community as a whole. For example, African Parks Network used a vague agreement with local chiefs who were taken to other national parks for a tour as justification to enforce an extension of the wildlife reserve to ancestral land that was being farmed by the communities. This left community members not only voiceless, but also divided. This situation has been worsened even more by APN's tactic to coerce families, and women in particular, by offering to cover their children's school fees. 
Interviews with local chiefs and leaders of community organizations also revealed that though they are informed about the new developments inside the reserve, they do not have any powers to object to APN's management decisions. Consequently, they are forced to align themselves with the APN management for fear of jeopardizing their relationship with the organization. The Ojalakokoa National Park in the Republic of Congo is another case that merits being highlighted. The park, created in 1935 when the country was a French colony, appropriated the biggest forest area in the region, with 1.35 million hectares. Since 2010, the management of this nirvana for nature lovers, as African Parks Network describes it, has been placed entirely in African Parks Network's hands for a period of 25 years. The partners of the park include groups such as WWF and the European Union. African Parks Network partnered with the Congo Conservation Company, CCC, an enterprise created and funded by a German philanthropist in order to undertake tourist business activities in the Ojala Cocoa National Park. This includes three high end lodges, which tourists can access by flying in on charter flights from the Congolese capital, Brazzaville. However, very few inhabitants of Brazzaville have the possibility to enjoy such luxury tourism. A four-day Ozala Gorilla Discovery Camp visit, for example, costs 9690 U.S. dollars per person. While the park was founded in 1935, African Parks Network states that humans have occupied the area for 50,000 years. The company notes that 12,000 people still live around the park, yet it is still one of the most biologically diverse and species-rich areas on the planet, emphasis added. With this formulation, rather than recognizing the inhabitants' contribution towards keeping the forest standing after all these thousands of years, the company makes it clear that in its view, the presence of people is not compatible with the aim of conserving forests. It is despite the community's presence that there is still some remaining biodiversity. African Parks Network claims to protect the park with an enhanced Echo Guard team and other law enforcement techniques, besides investing in changing human behavior. These claims and views on conservation make clear that for this network and its funders and allies, people living in and around forests are considered a threat, and that their conservation business can be better run without them. It should be no surprise that for more than 10 years, African Parks Network has shown an interest in exploring if the Odzala Cocoa Park could be turned into a red project because through the lens of such projects, communities are also considered a threat and blamed for deforestation. Furthermore, there are no provisions for communities to receive a share of the profits from the sale of carbon credits. A travel list uh, for us communities is the people and the places, the landscapes, the ecosystems, the assets that belong to you, and the businesses, the cultures that make each place unique and ultimately a destination that the world wants to visit. This is a powerful coalition of some of the biggest names in travel and technology. Not one entity entity can own sustainability. We need to work together to change the course and focus on how travel and tourism can bring prosperity to the whole entire system. So now do you all see how this all fits together? What Harry is doing is supporting this new type of colonialism. In my humble opinion, I think he's no better than back in the day when his ancestors had colonized, you know, different parts of land as well as enslaved people. Harry, in my humble opinion, has this so-called unconscious bias, but I do think it is conscious. I do think he is racist, and I do think that he sees himself superior to everybody else. And what he is doing here in essentially forcing or participating in being a part of an organization that is forcing people from their native lands in order to profit 
just shows exactly who Meghan and Harry are. They don't care about people. They care about exploiting people and making money from it. So when we talk about Meghan and Harry being strapped for cash, I highly doubt that because of his role within these particular organizations. So at some point, in my humble opinion, I do think that Travelis will integrate with African Parks. It just makes sense to do so. And I believe that he set this organization up to profit from this whole setup with this African Parks Network. But what do you guys think? Do you agree with me? Do you think that Travelis does align with African Parks Network and what is happening is so wrong and gross? Or do you think they're not connected? But definitely let me know your thoughts below. As always, I will be back with more content, but until then, please be safe, and I will talk to you later. Bye! Such a broad.